Professor Sarah Gilbert has been making and testing vaccines designed to induce T cell responses for over 10 years, chiefly using antigens from malaria and influenza. Several of the vaccines developed in her laboratory have progressed into clinical trials, and we are absolutely thrilled to be joined by the fabulous Professor Sarah Gilbert. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. I know how incredibly busy you are, so we're absolutely honoured to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank you. Uh, Professor Sarah, you must be immensely proud of your work in helping humanity come through this pandemic. How did you become involved uh, and leading this amazing work in vaccinology? Well, it's been a long journey to, to get to where I am now. I've actually been at the University of Oxford for 27 years mm -hmm. uh, and almost all of that time working on vaccine development, um, starting with ideas about how to, as you said, make vaccines that would induce a strong T cell response as well as an antibody response, which is what we normally think of inducing when we make a vaccine. Mm -hmm. But then also um, some of the pathogens, the viral pathogens that can cause outbreaks that we don't hear about so much, but they're, they're out there and they occasionally cause outbreaks in people. And one of those was the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, and that's a coronavirus. So when the, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus first started causing infections in China, and we got to hear about that very early in January 2020, because it was a coronavirus, we already had a template to follow to, to start to make a vaccine against it as quickly as possible. And the, the, the public think, sometimes I think with, with the COVID-19 vaccine, that, um, that it's just been, you know, a, a few months, you know, and you guys have just been working it for a few months. And as you say, you know, this is, this is over many, many years, isn't it? How, how do you get to the point, though, where it can be safely used by society? Well, we use what we call a platform technology. So it's a way of making vaccines that we can use to make lots of different vaccines. And we do a lot of work on the technology. So we understand it, we've used it in a lot of other clinical trials for vaccines against other diseases. And that all helps us in being prepared to develop a new vaccine when we need to. So there's already a lot of information about how to manufacture the vaccine, how to test it before 2020. Yeah. So um, that enabled us to get off to a really quick start. But then when we start making the new vaccine, uh, we have to manufacture it ready for clinical trials in a very, very controlled fashion. And there's a lot of testing. All of the raw ingredients are tested very thoroughly to make sure that they're what they should be and that they aren't contaminated with anything else. And at all stages of the vaccine manufacturing process, it's very highly controlled. And then we have to apply for permission to start testing the vaccine in people in what we call a first in human study, the first time people get immunized with this particular vaccine. And then eventually we need to find out if the vaccine actually stops people getting infected with, with the virus. Uh, and that's what we do in a phase three trial. And we had about 24,000 people enrolled in that trial in multiple countries. And eventually the statisticians um, break the code and they see were the infections incurring in the people who had the vaccine or the placebo. And then we know how well it works. And now what's really important is we're getting what's called real world effectiveness data. So because the vaccine's being widely used after it was licensed for emergency use, we're able to track how well it works in the over 80s, the over 70s, the over 60s that started receiving it in the, in the national rollout. And it's been extremely effective at preventing people, even the oldest people who had it from going into hospital uh, and from preventing severe disease, and we've also seen that in people who've been vaccinated, even if they do get infected, they have a mild disease and they shed the virus for a shorter amount of time. So that reduces opportunities for the transmission. Mm -hmm. So all of this data gets put together. So we've got a thorough understanding of how the vaccine's working. Really systematic process. Yeah, um, if you can cast your mind back to when you first heard about COVID-19, what was you and your team's reaction? And did you think at that time that you'd be able to make such a significant difference to people? Well, at that time, um, when we first heard about a cluster of uh, pneumonia cases of unexplained cause, um, it was interesting to me because I work on vaccines against viruses that cause outbreaks. This could be a, an outbreak and it could be a new disease, but it might not have been. Following the information coming out and gradually over the course of a few days, we found out that it wasn't any of the known viruses, but it was a coronavirus. Um, and so I was thinking with my team about getting started straight away to make a vaccine. And AstraZeneca, who licensed the vaccine from the university and took on the large scale manufacturing, they started all of that work before we knew that the vaccine was effective because we had to have that underway as quickly as possible. So the, the principle is as soon as we could do something, we did, even though we didn't know if it was actually going to be required. So we've had this 
fast spreading virus and you know within a year created the vaccine as an engineer what i'm really interested in is what role did technology play in that and and would it even have been possible in 10 years 10 years ago um, we've certainly used technology to speed up the way we do some parts of the process. So one important change that we've made in the past couple of years is in the very early development of the vaccine in the lab, where we have to know that it's exactly the right thing genetically before we start to produce it in larger amounts. And that used to be something that took a long time. But now we use um, next generation sequencing, whole genome DNA sequencing. We can overnight get a read of everything that's in our vaccine preparation and find out if it's exactly as it should be. Um, so that aspect of testing has really speeded things up because we were able to go very quickly from designing the vaccine to making a small stock that we could then take into our manufacturing facility and get ready for clinical trials. Uh, with our volunteers, we take blood samples at multiple times uh, and we separate it into the cells and the serum for different immune, on, immune testing. And uh, we used to just do all that with hand labeling. So now everything is um, programmed and barcoded and we can use a reader to tell us in, what's in this tube, which person is it from, um, what date is it from, um, how long is that after they got vaccinated and so on. So that's made handling of large numbers of samples, which we've needed to do a lot more straightforward. Sarah, I think we're in a different era now as well. You know, 10 years ago, we would never have heard about individuals and teams working in your field. And now, you know, you and your team are, are household names, aren't you? you do you think yeah. that the pandemic has made people think differently about the work that goes into creating drugs and vaccines? And, and do you think we'll see more collaboration like this in the future? Well, what's been really important is the collaboration between different bodies, so between universities and government and uh, pharmaceutical companies, all working together with the shared aim. And that was the, the way everything worked last year. We all wanted to achieve the same thing. And so we all did what we could together to make that happen, to have a vaccine which was um, very safe and highly effective, tested as quickly as possible and available for use. And I would like to see more of that in the future. There's a lot of innovation in universities, uh, which doesn't always get out into the real world and get used. And, and that's something I'd like to see more of. And obviously we do, it's quite an expensive thing to, to develop these vaccines and do the clinical trials. So we have to prioritize how are we going to spend research funding uh, to make the best use of the innovations that um, can come out of the universities and can then protect human health. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my daughter and I read books together called Women in Science. Um, in a few years, I want to see a Women in Science book with Dr. Sarah Gilbert, so I can read that to my daughter. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. It's been a privilege to talk to you. Thank you very much.